Numbers 2 in this series. Um, and we're, what we're doing is we're, we can, I understand that Leviticus and Numbers, and, and there's other parts of the Bible that can be kind of hard for us to understand, but I know Leviticus and Numbers, when it talks about the sacrifices, when it talks about the priesthood, when it talks about those things, it's sometimes harder for us to understand those because there's a disconnect there because we didn't grow up under that system. We're under the, the new covenant and, uh, and what Christ has done for us. But uh, it's important that we don't disregard the Leviticus uh, law or the, the book of Numbers or any of those things in Scripture that we don't understand or we don't makes us feel comfortable. Um, and we can easily fall prey to, well, I don't understand it, so I'll just disregard it and not take time to understand it. Um, and so we're looking at that um, because really it is the basis, it's the foundation uh, for our faith in Christ and understanding the full work that Christ did for us. We have to understand uh, the, the precursor that went before. And so last week we, we looked at the sacrifices, we looked at the inferior sacrifice of the Old Testament, and then we looked at the perfect sacrifice that, that, uh, that Christ performed. Um, the, the ministry of Christ is, is unique. Last week we looked at him as the sacrifice. This morning we're going to be looking at him as the high priest. And so uh, in his ministry, not only was he the high priest, uh, but he was also the sacrifice. Um, and so that's what we looked at last week. He was the sacrifice. This morning we're going to be looking at that he is our high priest. Um, let me start with the Leviticus chapter 9, uh, starting in verse 1 through 24. On the eighth day, Moses called Aaron and his sons and his elders and the elders of Israel. And he said to Aaron, Take for yourself a bull calf for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering, both without blemish, and offer them before the Lord. And say to the people of Israel, Take a male goat for a sin offering and a calf and a lamb, both a year old without blemish, for a burnt offering, and an ox and a ram for peace offerings to sacrifice before the Lord, and a grain offering mixed with oil, for today the Lord will appear to you. And they brought what Moses commanded in front of the tent of meeting, and all the congregation drew near and stood before the Lord. And Moses said, This is the thing that the Lord commanded you to do, that the glory of the Lord may appear to you. Then Moses said to Aaron, Draw near to the altar and offer your sin offering and your burnt offering, and make atonement for yourself and for the people, and bring the offering of the people, and make atonement for them as the Lord has commanded." So Aaron drew near to the altar and killed the calf of the sin offering, which was for himself. And the sons of Aaron presented the blood to him, and he dipped his finger in the blood and put it on the horns of the altar and poured out the blood at the base of the altar. But the fat in the kidneys and the long lobe of the liver from the sin offering he burned on the altar, as the Lord commanded Moses. The flesh and the skin he burned up with at the fire outside the camp. Then he killed the burnt offering, and the Aaron's sons handed him the blood and threw it against the sides of the altar. And they handed the burnt offerings to him piece by piece and the head, and he burned them on the altar. And he washed the entrails and the legs and burned them with the burnt offering on the altar. Then he presented the people's offering and took the goat of the sin offering that was for the people and killed it and offered it as a sin offering like the first one. And he presented the burnt offering and offered it according to the rule. And he presented the grain offering, took a handful of it, burned it on the altar besides the burnt offering of the morning. Then he killed the ox, the ram, the sacrifice of peace offerings for the people. And Aaron's sons handed him the blood, and he threw it against the sides of the altar. But the fat pieces of the ox and of the ram, the fat tail, and that which covers the entrails and the kidneys and the and the long lobe of the liver, they put the fat pieces on the breast. He burned the fat pieces on the altar, but the breast and the right thigh Aaron waved for a wave offering before the Lord as he commanded. Then Aaron lifted up his hands toward the people and blessed them, and he came down from the offering, the sin offering, and the burnt offering, and the peace offerings. And Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting. And when they came out, they blessed the people, and the glory of the Lord appeared all to them. And the fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the pieces of the fat on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. Now flip over to Hebrews chapter 7, verse 11 through 28. 
Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would have there been for another priest to raise after the order of Melchizedek rather than one named after the order of Aaron? For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, and in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is written of him, You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, a, for, a com, former commandment is set aside because its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath, for those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. But this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. This makes Jesus the underwriter of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office, but he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it is, was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once and for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their, wicked, in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. This is the word of the Lord. Shall we give thanks this morning? Father, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for both the Old and the New Testaments. Lord, we thank you for those parts of the, the scriptures that are hard for us to understand, parts that, that we just, it's hard for us to navigate because the offering sacrifices and the priesthood and the tabernacle and all those, the articles that are in there are so foreign to us because we live on the other side of that from what Christ has done. Lord, help us as we look at the priesthood. Help us, Lord, to see how Christ is the great high priest. Lord, speak to us, I pray, through your word. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. <clears throat> the priesthood of the Lord Jesus is far greater than the Levitical priesthood. The writer of Hebrews sets out to make and prove that, and he does a wonderful job by bringing up the inferiorness and the, the weakness of the Levitical priest and then comparing and contrasting that to the priesthood of Christ. Uh, Derek Tinball, in the message of Leviticus, uh, asserts that the gospel, which presumes a knowledge of sacrifice and atonement of law and grace, of sin and obedience, of defilement and cleansing, of priesthood and temple curtains, makes little sense without it. Leviticus serves as a preliminary sketch of the masterpiece that was to be unveiled in Christ. The, fullness, the fullest exposition of the relationship between Leviticus and the gospel, of course, is to be found in the letter to the Hebrews. Leviticus forms a foundation not only for the gospel, but for Christian living. While the New Testament draws up new maps to guide the moral and spiritual life of the Christian, it does so by making use of the earlier charts of Leviticus. Particularly, applications may have changed, but the guiding ethical principles remain as firm as ever. Without Leviticus, our Christian experience would be a house without a foundation. <clears throat> 
So as we look at this series, as we look at Leviticus, we look at Numbers, we look at those passages, understand that they serve as the foundation for all that we believe. To fully understand and grasp what Christ did, we have to understand the, the meaning behind the Levitical sacrifices. That's what we looked at last week. To understand the priesthood of Christ, that he is our high priest, we have to have a somewhat working knowledge of what the high priest did and the functions that he did under the Old Testament law. And in that, we see how Christ not only fulfills the Old Testament, but he supersedes it. It is vital that we do not disregard the Levitical law because it serves as a foundation in our understanding of the full work and ministry of the Lord Jesus. It allows us to fully appreciate when he said, it is finished. That was what the priest said. When the sacrifice was done and atonement was made, the priest would say, it is finished. So Christ on the cross, our high priest, offering himself as the sacrifice, is saying, it is finished, fulfilling the priestly duties of Christ. The Apostle Paul instructs us in Colossians chapter 2 that all these things were a shadow of things to come. So as we look at the Old Testament, we look at the law, we look at the, the ceremony and the priesthood and the sacrifices, all of those things were given to the people of God to prepare them and, and help them understand what the Son of God, the Lamb of God, the Messiah would accomplish. And the same is true for you and us, from you and me, that we can fully appreciate and understand what Christ has done for us when we understand a, a working knowledge of what the Old Testament law and the uh, sacrificial system and the priesthood uh, and what their ministry entailed so that it guides us in our devotion to the king. All that we read in the law of Moses points to and find its fulfillment in the Lord Jesus. I find it fascinating that Hebrews really is uh, this wonderful letter that is given to the church that helps connect what the Old Testament, what the prophets, what the priesthood, what the sacrifices did, and it connects it to the finished work of Christ on the cross. Um, and so if you want to understand Leviticus, you want to understand the law, Hebrews is a beautiful letter given to us that helps us to look at those things and to see its meaning and its fulfillment in Christ. So the first thing I want us to do is the first uh, is to look at the imperfect priesthood. Uh, verses 11 through 19 in Hebrews outlines, the, uh, the, the writer of Hebrews outlines the imperfections of the priesthood that was instituted through Aaron and his descendants. Uh, Aaron's mediation could not satisfy God's justice, pacify the conscience, or sanctify our hearts. Uh, the, the inferiorness of Aaron's priesthood is that they too needed to offer a sacrifice for themselves before they could offer a sacrifice for the people of God, right? So starting off, the writer of Hebrews points out that this is the flaw with the Levitical priesthood. They were sinners too. They needed to sacrifice for themselves before they could even minister to God on behalf of the people. If the Levitical priesthood was perfect, the writer of Hebrew reasons, then there would be no need for a change. There would be no need for a priest in the order of Melchizedek if the Levitical priesthood was perfect, right? We don't change unless we realize that what we're doing isn't working. Right? You don't change unless there's a, another product that is better. That's why all the commercials on new products, they'll say new and improved. Right? And they probably just switched up the formula just a little bit to say that it's new and improved. But it's to get us to not buy the old, but to buy what they're selling us now. Why? Because we understand that if it was still good, there's no need for the new and improved. There's only in the need for the new and improved because the old isn't as good. And so that's what the writer of Hebrews is saying is that the Levitical priesthood was perfect. If it was where it needed to be, there would be no need for a change. But the truth is the Levitical priesthood could only demonstrate a faint symbol of what the ideal priesthood would look like. The writer of Hebrews quotes Psalm 110 verse 4 and he says, You are a priest forever after 
the order of Melchizedek. And that quote from the psalm points to the insufficiency of the Levitical priesthood, for it contained the promise of the messianic priesthood, which was fulfilled in the Lord Jesus. You understand that the Messiah wasn't just a king, but he was also going to be priest. He was also going to be prophet. The role of the Messiah was not just a a conquering king, although that's what the inhabitants of the first century looked for. They wanted Messiah to be the king that he was going to establish the, the throne of God forever. They didn't realize that the Messiah, when he first came, was going to be the priest, that he was going to make uh, propitiation for our sins, and that he was going to make atonement for us. Now, the Messiah will return, and this time when he returns the second time, he will establish his throne, and he will be the conquering king. The problem with the first century was they didn't want the priesthood of the Messiah. They wanted the conquering king of the Messiah, and Jesus came the first time as the priest of God to make atonement for our sins. The Lord Jesus was not of the ancestry of Levi, but of Judah. The writer of Hebrews points out that, you know, if this was a, a, the same priesthood, it would, he would have been of the same tribe of Levi, but he was that of Judah. And Moses didn't say anything about Judah uh, having a priesthood. In fact, as Judah was where the rulers, the king, would come from. This change proves the impotence of the Levitical priesthood that was based solely on hereditary means. You were born into it. You didn't, weren't called to it. You weren't chosen for it. You were born to it. And, and all those that were born of the tribe of Levi were, were priests. Of those that were descended of Aaron were, were the high priests. It was all based on your birth and not really of your choosing. It's also important to note that the new priesthood would be an everlasting priesthood. One by one, the priests began to uh, serve with Aaron, and Aaron was the first high priest, and there came a moment when he died, and his son served as priest, and there was a time in history when they died, and their sons, and their sons, and their sons, generation after generation, served as priest before the Lord, and served as high priest before the Lord, and what, generation after generation, they died. But Jesus himself is the life everlasting. In fact, John eleven twenty five, 25, Jesus tells Mary and Martha that he is the resurrection and the life. From this, it follows that verse 18 and 19, that the Levitical priesthood and the entire ceremonial law, which enshrined it, have been annulled by what? Verse 19, a better hope. Aren't you glad for that? A better covenant The hope of of a capable priesthood, of a dispensation both of a spiritual and permanent, thus of the immediate and perfect access to God. What Aaron and his descendants couldn't do, the Lord Jesus was able to do. This morning, let's focus our attention, most of our attention now, on that perfect priesthood that we see in verse 20 through 28. The Lord Jesus is the true priest of all mankind, for whom... The nations have been waiting. We see that throughout the Old Testament that the Messiah was going to be king, not just over Israel, but over all the earth. That the Messiah was going to be a priest unto God, not just for the nation of Israel, but for all nations. We took communion this morning. It's a reminder of what John the Revelator saw, right? He saw a vast multitude surrounding the throne of God, and they're all worshiping from every tongue, tribe, and nation of people of the earth surrounding Him, worshiping Him. The perfect priesthood. The Lord Jesus is the apostle of God. He is the intercessor with God for man. We don't have any intercessor between us and the Father than the man Christ Jesus. He is the only intercessor we have. It's not the Pope. It's not the saints. It's not your grandma. It's not your pastor. It's not anybody but the Lord Jesus. He is the only intermediator between the Father and us, and He is making intercession for you and me all the time, every day before the Father. It is through Him that we have access to the Father. It is through Him that we pray and we make our requests and our needs known to the Father. It is not through any other entity but the Lord Jesus. He is our only high priest and He is our great high priest. Verse 20 through 28 reminds us how infinitely exalted His priesthood is above that of Aaron. Aaron. 
You see, Aaron had to make sacrifices for himself. He had to make atonement for himself before he could minister to the people. He was the intermediary between God and the people. And so he had to make sure that he was right with God first. So he had to offer that sacrifice for himself first, apply the blood to himself first, and then he was able and fit to serve God for the, on behalf of the people. But the Lord Jesus was perfect, sinless. He didn't have to offer a sacrifice. And again, Aaron had to, and his descendants had to offer a sacrifice every single time before they could minister to God on behalf of the people. They had to first make atonement for themselves. Verses 20 through 22 points out that the Lord Jesus was consecrated with an oath. The Levitical priests were not installed by such. They were installed by simply who their father was. The priesthood of the Lord Jesus enters into the very substance of the everlasting covenant. That's why it goes forever. This new covenant lasts for all eternity because it is the perfect covenant. Because it was able to do what the old couldn't do. Verse 23 through 25 demonstrates Christ's priesthood is non-transferable. The priesthood of Aaron was transferred from one generation to the next. They got to a certain age. The Levitical priest could no longer serve. They had to retire. And you could only, I think it was from 20 to 50 was the, the, the lifespan of where they would serve. Once they were turned 20, they were thrown into the service. And once they were 50, they would retire. And it would be passed down to the next generation. But the Levitical priesthood had this defect. That it required to be conveyed from one man to another. And so you could have a good priest for a few years and then you could have a bad priest for a few years, right? You could have one that could really understand the heart of God and then you could have priests that they were just there not because they were called by God but because well, that was what they were called to do because of who their father was. But the Lord Jesus is eternal and His mediation is not transferable to anyone because no one else is worthy to stand before a holy God and a fallen mankind. The Bible says in Revelation that, that the heaven looks for these seals to be unsealed. And it says, who is worthy? No one is worthy to undo these seals. And yet the Lamb of God comes onto the scene and they say, only He is worthy. We have to understand that only the Lord Jesus is worthy enough to be the mediation between a holy God and a fallen man. As a result, in verse 25, is consequently, He is able to save to the uttermost just as we talked about last week the inferiority of the sacrificial system and how it couldn't take away the sin so it is with the priesthood the reason why his priesthood is a perfect priesthood is because he is able to do what the priest couldn't do and he is able to save to the uttermost aren't you glad that he can save to the uttermost that means there is nothing that is without his reach that he can't redeem we like to think that, well, I wasn't that bad of a person that God reaches down. But understand, it doesn't matter how bad we are. It doesn't matter how much we've fallen into sin. His arm is long enough to reach us and to take us out because he is able to save to the uttermost. Not partial salvation, not a somewhat salvation, but a complete salvation and a saving. And I love that word, to the uttermost. Verse 26 highlights the character of the Lord Jesus Verse 26 says that he is holy. He's not common, not ordinary. Those vessels that were, were holy were set apart. They weren't like the others. He was holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. There is no one like the Lord Jesus. The Levitical priests needed to offer sacrifices first for their sins before offering the sins the sacrifices for the sins of the people, not just one time, but every time that they ministered, they had to sacrifice first for themselves. And we looked at last week that those sacrifices couldn't take away the guilt and the stain of sin. And so even though they offered a sacrifice for themselves, they were still guilty of that sin because the stain was still on their garments. But because Christ is a holy a person from God that uh, without sin... Right Without spot or wrinkle, He is perfect Lamb of God. He's able to truly intercede on our behalf because He is fully God and He's fully man. He's able to make that mediation between God the Father and us. 
Even the most pious of people still fall short of God's glorious standards. Even if we set out to be the most pious, most godly of individuals, we still fall short of His glorious standard, of His holiness, of His righteousness, and of His justice. Yet there is one who does, and that is Christ Jesus. You see, the Lord Jesus lived a sinless life and was not stained by sin. Because of that, not only is he the perfect sacrifice, but he is also the perfect priest to mediate that agreement between God and us. Verse 27 and 28 shows us that his sacrifice was perfect. The the Levitical priest had to offer up a sacrifice daily, the same sacrifices year after year after year. And you contrast that with the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus that was offered once for all people. You see, the priest had to continually offer a sacrifice, but our great high priest only had to oversee and offer one sacrifice for all people. His blood atones for sin. That which the blood of animals could not do, his blood was able to accomplish. And then finally, in verse 26 and 28, asserts that the Lord Jesus ministers in the real sanctuary. This is the other contrast between the Levitical priesthood and the insufficiency of that and the priesthood of Christ is that Aaron's ministry was carried out in a moving tent that's called a tabernacle. And yet the ministry of Christ is in heaven itself, in the true sanctuary. And we know that the the tabernacle and the way that it was laid out, God gave Moses the details, the the specifications of how big the tent was going to be and the articles and all the dimensions for everything and where to lay everything because it was a foreshadow. It was a copy of what was in heaven. And so Aaron and his descendants ministered in a copy of the original. Can we tell you, the copy is never the same as the original. Right? You can have a Van Gogh, but if it's just a copy, it's not the same value of the original. We went to a museum and I thought, man, these paintings, only to find out that they were fakes, right? They were just copies. And you felt a little disappointed. It looked like the real thing, right? And as you got up, you could really see the brush strokes and all of that. And you really thought this was the real masterpiece. And then you're like, oh, it's a copy. Now, for obvious reasons, because we would want to touch it, we would ruin it. But it just it was just unsettling to think you first was drawn into this painting and then you're left a little disappointed because even though it was a good copy, it looked just like the original. It wasn't the original. The tabernacle and later the temple were good copies. But that's all they were, copies. It wasn't the true sanctuary of God. But we know that Christ... He ministers in the imperishable sanctuary. He ministers in the original place there in heaven. Hebrews 8.2 says, A minister in the holy places, in the true tent, the true tabernacle, that the Lord Jesus set up, not for man. See, Jesus is our great high priest. He is the mediator between God and us. And he is the one that is actively interceding on our part. One of the ministries of the, the, the Levitical priests was that they would be the mediator. God wanted to speak to the people. He would speak through the priest. The, the way that they would be made right before God was through the priest. The priest was the intermediary. He was between God and the people. We see that even in Aaron's ministry when they were being, uh, a plague was being hit. And what did Aaron do? He went to the tabernacle, to the front of the tent, and he stood between heaven and earth, between God's judgment and the healing that they needed. And it was a precursor, a foreshadow of the ministry of the great high priest, which is the Lord Jesus, who stands between God's judgment and our sinfulness, that through him we can attain the mercy that we need. In closing, where Aaron fails, the Lord Jesus succeeds. All glory and honor and power belongs to our great high priest who makes intercession for us. And even in this very moment, the Lord Jesus is sitting at the right hand of Almighty God and he is making intercession for you. He is interceding for you. What is, what is he doing? He is praying for you.
Aren't you glad that he is the great high priest, an eternal high priest, who is eternally praying on our behalf and interceding for us? And by his sacrifice and through his ministry, he is able to save us to the uttermost. Our salvation is not built on a shaky foundation, but upon the rock of the Lord Jesus. And as the writer of Hebrews closes out our text, he is the insurer of a better covenant. The Old Testament had its purpose, had its place. It was a precursor of a better covenant. And Jesus is the insurer of that better covenant. And the scriptures tells us that he has given us his Holy Spirit as a down payment of the glory that is to come. Aren't you glad for that this morning? Would you join me in praying and worshiping him this morning? Thank you, Father God, for the Lord Jesus, that he is our high priest. He is the one who makes mediation between us. Lord, we thank you for your ministry as you intercede on our behalf, as you pray to the Father on our behalf, knowing that we are just dust, we are frail. Lord, we get frightened so easily, and you know it well. Lord, we try to do and intend to do what is right, but we fail so many times. We end up not doing what we want to do, and we end up doing what we don't want to do. Lord, you know what it's like to live in these earthen vessels and how frail and fragile they are, how weak we are. We thank you that you're the perfect high priest, that you lived in an earthen body like ours. You know the weaknesses that it comes with. You know what we go through. You walked this earth with us. You know what it's like to be human. We thank you for you as our high priest who makes intercession for us, mediates between a holy God. We thank you and we glorify you today. And Father, we pray that you would speak to our hearts. God, help us to walk after you as Jesus, our great example that we're to follow, that, Lord, we would follow it. And that, Lord, we would apply your word to our lives. That, Lord, we would be all that you've called us to be. That you've saved us to be. So that we would be reflections of your glory to the world around us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the powerful name of our great high priest, Jesus. Amen and amen.